Are you concerned about all this corruption being misgendered as conspiracies? Well, don't you worry. Sit back, relax, and join in the conversation as we talk with today's guest. Welcome to another LSB Film Productions podcast with your host, Chris Brooks. Hello and welcome to the channel. It's me, Chris Brooks, for another LSB Film Podcast. Today I'm joined with Eileen O'Connor. Eileen, Eileen O'Connor has been campaigning for the last 20 years to the dangers of radiation, whether that's 2, 3, 4, 5G. And this is a bit of a, a life mission for you, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's, um, I, I got involved with the campaign in 2001 um, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I'd been living um, 100 meters from a, a, a foam mast uh, for over seven years. So it was one of the early foam masts um, that was put up in the network back in the 90s. And back in that time, you know, I didn't really understand what it was at the time. I just thought it looked ugly. Um, I didn't associate the symptoms that I was having and my family was having um, to the foam mast at the time, you know, and at the mm. time, during those years, it's understandable. Yeah, during those years, uh, I was suffering with sleep problems. My son was having horrific nosebleeds. My daughter was having um, these terrible hallucinations, you know, in the in the middle of the night. And um, you know, we we didn't we didn't realise at the time we were living in 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 a village in Wishaw in in the West Midlands, and we didn't realise at the time that the neighbours living in uh, neighbouring houses were also all experiencing si similar symptoms. And it wasn't until I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I was only 38 um, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, no history of it in my family. And so it was a, a shock. Um, mm -hmm. And then I started um, bumping into neighbours in the hospital who were also being diagnosed with breast cancer. So lots of us were diagnosed with breast cancer um, at the end, it was six ladies out of the 18 houses that were diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, we had That's another name. That's quite a name. number, isn't it? it? Oh, yes. And all young and to uh, happen all around the same time. Um, and it wasn't just breast cancer. We had another neighbour who died of motor neurone disease. We had um, a, other, other cases of cancer. We had other women suffering with uh, pre-cancer cervical cells and suffering with fertility problems. And there was even a horse with an uh, Olympic standard horse that was, the vet couldn't get control of the blood problems. And, you know, and then we, we started to question um, what could have caused this. We knew it must have been an environmental cause for it to happen all at once. And, you know, to a young, a young age group as well. And uh, it was then we started to look into the research. Um, and at that time, the it, the internet was in its infancy. Mm. So there wasn't really as much information available online. And it wasn't easy access, as, as easily accessible as it is today. So we were actually telephoning professors in universities and, you know, just gathering all this information together. And realizing that the, this the information old school research, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. and it's uh, and going door to door, you know, mm. to to the neighbours and and making a, a list of people's illnesses, and we then contacted um, public health and all and our MP and the councillors and environmental health and called for a full investigation, and uh, the director of public health actually uh, agreed that we should be allowed to have um, blood tests carried out. And we discovered that quite a number of us, including myself, had low white blood cells, which is actually connected with the research. When you look into the research now, you know that um, this radiation can affect the low, mm. low white blood cells. And, um, you know, so that... And is that what causes the cancer? It can it can be a lead precursor to lead towards that. There's other there's other other sort of ways of, you know, the lack of the fact that we were many of us unable to sleep. You know, we'd be mm -hmm. wide awake at three o'clock in the morning, you know, and so you're not really getting the deep sleep and the deep repair and that and that melatonin process that helps to repair your cells at night. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the oxidative stress as well and the damage to, you know, the free radicals and. Uh, there's, you know, lots of avenues really that can lead towards 
the diagnosis of, of cancer, which is there were other cancer cases as well in the village. Um, so we were one of the first cancer clusters really at that time, you know. And, and what year was this, sorry? This was when we discovered the cancer cluster was 2002, shortly after I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And that's we set up a grassroots campaign group at the time called SCRAM, and that okay. stood for Seriously Concerned Residents Against Masts. And, um, and then we really campaigned. You know, we had at that time, we had mainstream media and all the no local newspapers in full support. Um, it was a different time. Mm. Um, and we back, had back you know, when every, um, newspapers actually printed. Yeah, print. a, a absolutely brilliant support at that time. And, you know, we, we went on GMTV and This Morning and Sky News and, you know, all the. All the, the oh, really, wow. So it was yeah, a proper, proper. Really full on campaign. And after, and we, we engaged with solicitors in Birmingham as well. And we, we paid thousands of pounds for these solicitors to review the research that we had to that date. And they actually advised us to put the industry on notice, which they actually sent a letter of notice on our behalf. And the reason they did that was because they, they advised us that the smoking industry were never put on notice, but the asbestos industry were. Mm. And, the, and so asbestos was held to account but the smoking industry were able to duck and dive, you know, for many years. And it, incidentally, the, you know, the uh, mobile phone industry seemed to be following that same playbook yeah. as the smoking industry. Um, you know, so we, we put, we, we served a letter of notice on T-Mobile and Crown Castle. Crown Castle owned the land. And in that letter of notice, we listed all the, re you know, all the research we had to that date and also, the list of illnesses within the people living in the village. And we called on them to remove the mast. And we said at that point that, you know, if, if they were faced in a future court of law, they wouldn't be able to claim that they didn't know, you know, that this information was available. Well, anyone can serve notice. You don't need a solicitor to do that. I've since learned, you know, so, you know, I've since used that um, advice and served notice on the government myself from the Radiation Research Trust. But um, back in that day, it did shake them up a little bit where T-Mobile started to offer other locations and um, every other location they offered was right in someone else's backyard. So. That wasn't acceptable either. You know, we couldn't push the, our, our problem onto somebody else. So we continued to work with our solicitors to see what other avenue we, we could take. And then a, a shock event happened. Uh, it was on the day I'd actually visited to the solicitors in Birmingham. And it was bonfire night. And, um, and, the, and the next morning after bonfire, the mast was down on the ground. And um, to this day, we still don't know how that happened but we had um so massive... do, you, do you suspect it was the company as opposed well, we, to like we, vigilantes there's been um you know lots of people who've sort of said it could have been the company themselves because it was really getting hot under the collar um but we don't know to this day but the neck but saying that the next day t-mobile were there with another replacement mast um, you know, trying to put another mast up in replace of the one that was on the ground. Mm. And um, we were pleading with the engineers not to do it because, you know, we were going through our treatments at that time with the chemotherapy, many of us. Yeah, I can and imagine that must, be, that, that must have been such a horrendous. It was horrendous. Mm. It was horrendous. And, um, and the first set of engineers just couldn't do it. They, you know, they couldn't face it and they said, we can't do it. So they left the scene. And um, mm. luckily, um, at that time, one of my neighbours who her daughter was visiting and it was in one of our neighbours who also had breast cancer and her daughter was visiting from Australia and her daughter was working for a, one of the biggest law firms in Australia at the time. And she actually asked us all to have a look at the land deeds. And this is something people should be inspecting now mm. because um, we, we lived in a countryside area. Um, but the the industry owned their own little strip of land where they had the mast. Anyway, when we pulled up the land deeds, we discovered that our neighbour owned what's known as a ransom strip. 
And it's just a tiny parcel of land, which was in front of the land that was owned by the industry. And she, she actually said, I, I said, I wondered why they used to phone and, and ask for, you know, just announce when they were coming to do any work on the mast. She said, I thought they were just being polite. <laughs> it was actually because they actually needed to let her know because they were crossing her land. Yeah, um, so we, um, we actually, myself and the solicitor went to the police and we informed the police that if they turned up with another mast, that they would be trespassing. So the, ma- the the police actually treated it as a civil matter then and said, well, okay, it's a civil matter. You know, we won't be assisting them in in um, being allowing them to bring the ne- a new mast in. Mm. Oh, how and, times have changed. Yeah. Birmingham City Council planning, planners at the time as well, they actually came out and, um, and gave orders to T-Mobile to say, if you are to replace a mast, it has to be exactly the same as what was there before. Because they were trying to replace it with something Mm. different. So um, anyway, we knew that the industry would take, you know, turn up in the middle of the night um, and do whatever it took to put that mast up. So we set up a huge camp um, uh, in the field, tents, and we we kept, we stayed there day and night for months. Um, That must have been quite vigorous. It was hard because it was in the winter as well and all over Christmas. And and anyway, they had security guards put on their site. So in the end, by the time we got through Christmas, we were really exhausted. And um, we paid for security guards ourselves, and we also um, paid for a CCTV camera to watch them, so we could watch them from our homes. That's good you idea. know, watch the site. Yeah, definitely. And uh, eventually, eventually, you know, after lots of um, negotiation and involving our MPs who were really helpful because we were on the border of Birmingham and part of the of our road was on the border of Warwickshire. So we had a, a Tory MP and a, a Labour MP either side of, you know, the border who um, we pulled into for support. And in the end, between, you know, lots of negotiation and pleading with them to just leave us alone, they ended up giving up and um, signed a letter just to say that they would find another location. And I believe the location they found in the end was down on the motorway, away from anyone's homes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but that That's was... Good. the. And then when that mast was gone, the relief we felt and the recovery of people who were living in the village, you know, those le- those who were suffering with the low white bl- blood cells are, are white blood cell count increased um the women that were suffering with the pre-cancer cervical cells and um, that they, they ended up with a we ended up with a baby boom the horse recovered you know um, so we had, is it did you did you was it like was it the confirmation that you needed once it had gone to say clearly it was that or, no, or were you 100 it was 100%, 100%, okay. 100% got there before then because um the, the the problems we'd had the radiation sickness symptoms and when we were started to discover what was going on because we had um scientists that, who actually came into our homes and took readings with their radiation detectors okay. and um and at that t- and at that time i um you know i decided i needed to get some shielding um, put around the beds at night, and 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 I contacted a company. And can, they're easily accessible now to buy these um, radiation bed canopies, protective bed canopies. Okay. But at that time, there weren't any suppliers at all. Um, there was only three military suppliers, um, and so I actually paid thousands of pounds to get this radiation screen and material that had silver within the material, and and uh, paid to have these canopies made to put over the beds. And my children at the time, they just thought it was about, it was something like, you know, a, a mosquito net. They had no, no idea really. why it was being put, placed over no. their beds. It's kind and of ironic, time, really, because it makes you wonder why they really got rid of lead paint, doesn't it? Because that would have yeah. stopped it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but my son's, my, my son's nosebleed stopped immediately. Mm. And my daughter started sleeping, no problem. And the same for me, you know. And um, and then after the radiation um, readings had been taken out, taken in other neighbours' houses, one of my neighbours had been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, and she'd even had a wheelchair delivered to a home. She was so ill. Um, but when they took the radiation levels in her in her home, 
the main beam of radiation was going through the bedroom where she was sleeping. And she was also sleeping in a metal bed. So she was able to move to a different bedroom, which was, you know, it was a, a large house, but mm. which wasn't in the main beam and, and sleep in a wooden bed. And it was almost like a miraculous recovery that she had, you know, so it was, um, and especially after the mast was gone. She said she was famous for saying that it was the best night's sleep she'd ever had <laughs> when yeah, we were asked, listen. you know, if anyone had heard anything. Um, so I'd had confirmation before the mast was gone, you know, that um, our symptoms were, re were related to to the um, radiation. No doubt about it whatsoever. You know, and I, and I, I now realise that it's a condition known as electrosensitivity. And I still suffer with that today. You know, and um, so I really, um, and especially now, even more so with the increase with 5G. Mm -hmm. So you can really feel that the levels have gone up. And um, it's a real concern, to be honest. And, and recently, especially here where I live, I live in Merseyside. And I'm absolutely... I've just, been, I've just had a podcast with somebody from Merseyside. Oh, oh, oh good. On the same subject. No, so, this is no. this is the wonderful Jack Beecham who's been taking uh, the Merseyside police over the hot coals for their oh. conduct. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So I was. I, I'm in Merseyside, and I'm absolutely horrified to know that Liverpool has got the largest 5G network in the whole of the UK. It's the second biggest in the world. And without any consultation, without any consent, they're even using um, unlicensed frequencies in the Kensington part of, of Liverpool, and which is it's absolutely horrifying. I don't think the people are aware of this Can you explain to me what that means, unlicensed well, they're using, frequencies? They're using frequencies. I mean, the frequencies they're using anyway, um, we're, we're complex, you know, it's doctors and scientists are saying, mm -hmm are putting people's lives at risk and health at risk um, and that the ICNERB guidelines are not protecting us at all. Um, from uh, They're only protecting us from the heating effects. Um, but these on license, but these are, those are the license frequencies that the government have sold off for billions, you know, but they're using on license frequencies that they haven't even sold off yet um, at 60 gigahertz in this part of Liverpool, you know, so um, that's, uh, uh, an experiment mm. so these people obviously don't know they're part of, of an experiment which we we all are really because the doctors and scientists uh, who, who are quoting or you know presenting all the thousands of publications showing that there are biological impacts below the heating threshold uh, and they're just being ignored but then on top of that we've got these 60 gigahertz frequencies being used as an experiment in a part of liverpool without people knowing mm. um should send real alarm bells ringing and it sent alarm bells ringing for me when i started hearing on the news recently of the deaths of two children two young children five and six at a school in everton in liverpool milstead school it's a special needs school and i kept hearing on the news that there'd been this outbreak of illness in the whole of the school and two children had died and every time you'd see mainstream news reports you'd see the news readers on the doorstep of the school but you didn't see a mast not on the mainstream news but i knew it was in this area you know where they're using the unlicensed frequencies mm. around that area and so i um i just went on google maps and lo and behold, there's the there's a huge mast right on the doorstep of the school. All the mainstream media that were there reporting are, stood right next to it, but keeping it out of sight, you know, for the mainstream news. And it's right next to the school. Also got to some massive substations, one virtually in the playground of the school and one right across the road from the school. So I, uh, I called on one of um, a friend who I've known for over 20 years, who also got involved with the radiation campaign many years ago, um, Glenn Hughes from EMF Protection. And he, he set up a, a business at that time, but, uh, but he got involved all them years ago for the same reasons where phone masks were put on the roof of the school where his children went and he he he, he set up what a campaign is it about the kids it always seems to be yeah. around schools doesn't children it? Yeah. yeah and and the children are the most vulnerable 
Mm. You know, science shows that children are more vulnerable. Some of the science has even shown that they, you know, they'll take 10% more radiation into the bone marrow of their skull than adults. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, it's absolutely criminal, I believe. And anyway, Glenn, I called on Glenn Hughes because he's, he's got a business and I know he, um, he's just um, pr produced um, and just launched a new meter that can actually detect 5G. There's not many meters around okay. that can do that. Because and there it's isn't quite... a, sorry, because there isn't actually 5G in the phone yet, is there? They're um, all 5G ready, but all the videos are Apparently all 5G is... ready, but we don't know whether they're activated yet. Mm -hmm. um, but then the peak readings that we're discovering, I, I, I've been in touch with Mona Neeson, who's um, one of the researchers with Leonard, Professor Leonard Hardell of the Swedish studies that have been taking all the readings in Sweden and the publications that they've released now and published, they're, they're, they're actually discovering really high peak readings. And they've said, you know, to, to, to get the reading that we actually picked up outside that school, they believe, you know, it must have 5G within it. But and when I actually did a, a site checker, um, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, a website called Site Checker, and you can check, um, you know, what um, what applications are in that area. And when I had a look, it said right at, around that area of the school that it had 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, and 5G Ultra. And so it has got different sort of applications. You can see on some of the on the on the posts around that area as well. Um, I've but never we heard of 5G Ultra. What no, would that be? Yeah. Exactly. Um, but, you know, that's what's on this um, site checker. Um, so signal checker. So um, anyway, I, I we went along with uh, Glenn and this new the meter he's got to detect 5G. Um, the mast is uh, for 4G. It's listed as 4G. But we, you know, suspect that it could it could have the 5G mm -hmm. um, you know, opportunity to be able to. Yeah. yeah. And um when he when he took the reading, he was in he was shocked. It was um it, it was the highest reading he's ever taken in over twenty years, right outside the school, still within these ICNERP guidelines that only protect your body from overheating, but well above what other countries such as Russia and China, parts of Eastern Europe, parts uh, would allow. Well above, mm -hmm. you know. So we act I actually put a letter together then on behalf of the Radiation Research Trust, directly to um, to the UK Health Security Agency, calling for a full investigation into the deaths of these children. And um, and then the response I, I received back was just, it's working within the ICNERP guidelines, um, no reason for concern, the deaths are of unknown causes. Well, I find that completely unacceptable. That's just not good enough. You know, when you've so got... Basically, other... it went down to SIDS. Did it go down to SIDS then, if it's unknown? Unknown, yeah, unknown. Unknown causes. Um, you know, that's not acceptable. When, you know, you've got other countries that that are that don't op operate in that, you know, that's above the levels that is acceptable in other countries. That's way above what, what um, has been called for as not safe by many doctors and scientists around the world. And but our UK health security agency going, carry on, no problem, keep going, you know. So is that mask still outside that school? It's though? still there. Yeah, it's still, it's there. still outside the school. And so then I discovered that um, Sefton, which which is neighbouring, you know, is under Liverpool, with part of Merseyside, Sefton Council are now going to start working with Liverpool to introduce five G and the Internet of Things throughout the whole of Sefton. So I went along to one of the council meetings to raise some questions and that went down like a lead balloon. They didn't want to hear it at all, the councillors that were there. Um, you know, I, 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 I remain polite throughout it, you know, because throughout these 20 years, I've, I've worked with, with um, MPs and MEPs and I've been, um, you know, I've been, I, I was invited actually many years ago by Sir William Stewart, who was the chairman of the UK Health Protection Agency and the chief scientist for the UK. I was invited to um, be part of uh, the EMF discussion group. 
at the Health Protection Agency. And there was both sides of the debate there. Um, so William Stewart listened. You know, he even went on Panorama and voiced his concerns about Wi-Fi in schools. And if, if you even read the Stewart report, because Sir William Stewart at that time was in, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, was asked by um, Tony Blair's government. He'd been Margaret Thatcher's main chief scientific, scientific advisor and then Labour's scientific advisor. And he was asked by Tony Blair's government to carry out a review. And and even the, uh, the Stuart report um, asked, advises the UK government to proceed with caution. That's all them years ago. And he even says that the main beam of radiation should not fall on any part of the school unless agreed by the parents or governors. Well, they're completely ignoring that, you know. And so Sir William Stewart, um, he went on Panorama as well To You can still watch that on, I think it's still on YouTube. You can still find it on YouTube. If I can find it, I'll put the link of that yeah, video definitely. in the video description. Watch it because you'll see um, a number of the scientists in there all voicing concerns along with our chief um, scientific advisor and um after that he ended up taking uh, early retirement well he re going into retirement and it's a shame really because we had a decent you know person who was willing to put his neck above the parapet and speak out mm. um but now um i think that's very rare to find anybody like that with working within the uk government it's a pity he still couldn't have continued <laughs> it, yeah even it is in retirement if it yeah. was that important, you know. It is, it is. Um, you know, so, but, you know, he's, he, he, I'm grateful to him for, for what he oh, tried yeah, to do yeah. and trying to bring both sides of the debate together. And fo following from that, he, he even spoke at an event that I organised in 2008. Um, I actually brought both sides of the debate together from the highest level in the world. I actually worked with the ex-leader of World Health well, and called on him to bring their side of the debate to, uh, to um, a conference. And I would bring all the independent scientists um, to debate, you know, within a two-day conference at the Royal Society in London. It took a year to organise that event. Um, it was so hard to, to bring them both together. There was no problem from the independent scientists taking that platform, um, but the the other side of the debate, um, the, you know, uh, status quo, the status quo, as I call them, scientists, um, you know, it was very difficult trying to get them to accept the invitation to attend. In fact, they actually wanted 90% of them against 10% of ours, which was, we were paying for the the, this conference, you know, and, uh, and we've got very little funds in our charity. Um, so it was, you know, in the end, we agreed on 50-50, which is, which is fair. Mm. And I knew that if we brought both sides of the debate together, that the scientists who are voice and concern would outweigh anything that was being said by the status quo scientists. And they yeah, did. And we had news. That? that was in 2008. See, I you bet they wouldn't even, I bet they wouldn't even entertain it now, would they? They wouldn't know, mm -hmm. but that uh, you can still look, you can still have a look at all those presentations. They're on our website, okay. but it, it very nearly didn't happen. The, the right up until the date, I, I, my phones were being tapped. I even, even found the police live on the line while really? I was organizing that event. Yeah. I've, I've noticed the police have been monitoring my, linkedin account even though i never use it i didn't even realize i had one um so yeah i, I think even me to an extent i, I didn't even know it was me. i didn't know it was the police that actually monitored the phones it was um i i was dialing my colleague who was a, a lawyer and uh as i rang his phone number the police actually answered the phone and said hello police monitoring services and i thought I got the wrong number at first and I and I said oh sorry I've got the wrong number dialed my colleague's number again and the police answered it again and I thought oh I've got the wrong number again so I um dialed the number again but at that third attempt they'd scrambled it to their answer phone so I reached an answer phone that said hello you've reached the police monitoring services and then I, I just put the phone down and then I and then I thought 
I'm going to ring and leave a message on this answer phone. So I dialed my colleague's number again. and But by then, the answer phone was obviously clicked in. And I got straight through to my colleague. And we knew we were being listened to and recorded. You That's know, a bit clumsy of the police, though, isn't it? Really was, yeah. Um, you know, I did mention it to one of, uh, to an MP who was going to actually bring it up in Parliament. Um, but what is that do? illegal? I believe it's illegal. Um, mm. But then they'd be, you know, why would they be wanting to monitor a, monitor someone who's just trying to bring both sides of the debate together? In all fairness, for everybody to hear what's, you know, the truth from, mm. you know, listen to both sides. Anyway, so that. Be. And then, and then I had a phone call from the Royal Society saying that they'd been told that there was going to be massive protests outside and that they had to pull the plug and they weren't going to allow me to hold the event there. This was with about two days to go and we were paying for flights for people coming all over the world. We were told we could have no more than 100 people in the audience or the other side wouldn't attend. Um, it was so difficult it, and, and I had to... We had um, MPs from each political party chair in all the sessions. So I had to get, um, you know, reassurance to the Royal Society that this wouldn't happen to allow it to go ahead. And then with just about a day to go, I had a call from the one of the main scientists from the Health Protection Agency, who's actually, I believe, still one of their advisors, telling me that, oh, I'm sorry, we're not allowed to speak at the event um, we're, we're, the, the, our government scientists are not going to be attending and that's, um, I know it'll come as a blow to you, but that's it. That's the mm. way it is. Mm. And so all the other side decided they were going to pull out with about a day to go. And that's when I pleaded with Sir William Stewart and said, please, you know, don't, don't allow this to happen. And he actually took the stand himself and he presented. So we managed to pull it off, managed to go ahead. Um, you know, and that and that I ended up with news reports all over the world. I've got a file, you know, this thick, full of news reports. And it was brilliant. And after that, I was invited then to try and do the same within the European Commission. And I worked with the European Commission with both sides of the debate within a discussion group for years. Mm -hmm. But and, and I kept thinking at the time, so naive, thinking... Oh, if we ju if I just carry on, you know, working with the UK government try and trying to get in, I was going in and out the UK Parliament, the European Parliament, then at the EU Commission to, you know, discussion group. And I was thinking, this is it. I'll help to get legislation change from the top down. That'll be the fastest way of doing it. I didn't realise that I, that was never going to happen. And it's only now, after all them years, I, the, the power is in the grassroots and we've got to get that message through to the public the public we're never it's never going to come from the government no. um there's so too the much is, money the thing is i mean right up until about 2020 i should imagine the majority of people still had this kind of belief that the government were there to help you yeah i know i think it, i think a lot of people now are beginning to realize that you know we, we we've We've things, got to aren't stop. What, things aren't no, what you, you think they are. They're not, you know, and, and my eyes have been opened over the years. I was naive myself, you know, believing that the government would listen and, and, and do everything they could to protect us. But, you know, from what I've seen over the years and, and they, all these years of campaigning, it's not happened. It's got worse. And so now we're facing 5G and I see it as a massive threat. You know, and um, in combination with all the other frequencies and the Internet of Things, um, everything in our house will be, you know, wireless and full of radiation and with no consideration to what's happening to our lives, to what's happening to our children, to what's happening to wildlife, the environment. Uh, you know, and people, some people may naively be, be thinking that, you know, all this net zero and everything is to protect the planet. But going down this direction, yeah. That's all it this, is. Yeah, uh, it is. Under it's the not thought. even about the money because these no. people have as all the money that they could possibly want. It's purely about control. Total control. Yeah. And they need 5G for that as well. You know, so um, you're going down this route, it's, it's, it, I just, I'm just really fearful of what's going to happen to the planet as a whole, mm. not just to 
our lives, but the planet as a whole. And it's really urgent. We, I, I see it as the most urgent, pressing problem on the wor- in the world today. You know, and and I think um, the sooner people realise, because they're doing it to themselves, it's the addiction with the phones and the technology um, that's driving it as well. You know, and the, and they are addictive. They, they've done a good number on us, is all I can say, haven't they? Yeah. They've you know, it's going to take a lot of um, willpower. Inform- <laughs> willpower, sort of determination, taking control over your children as well, especially to mm. protect their lives. And you only have to look at the children today and how it's affecting their mental health, you know, and um, it's not the same. They're, they're, not, they're not living the lives that a child should be living, you know, out and, you know, playing out with the friends and they're growing up too fast and it's just... Without a doubt, yeah. Yeah, it's sad to see, you know, and, yes. I, and, and I just hope people will really... I hope this information just reaches people before it's too late, before they end up like we did in our village, but it may be worse, you know, because of the rapid increase in these uh, frequencies now. And those Swedish studies that uh, I mentioned with Professor um, Leonard Hardell and Mona Neeson, Mm -hmm. they've shown that as soon as this this 5G is switched on um, and they're reaching these massive peak radiation levels that we also picked up at this school it's resulting in people um uh, and their symptoms becoming so severe where they can't sleep and the pains and in the heads and skin rashes and that you know it's so instant that people have had to leave their homes Mm. i mean what are we gonna do i i just i'm so upset for people who are placed in this position now and it's happening right now where these masts there's no, you know, consideration of any any exclusion zone put around people's homes. They're, they're just putting them right outside people's homes, right outside their bedroom windows, right in front of schools. It's out of control now with the industry being given, um, you know, permission to put these things anywhere they want. With and no the accountability. Count- and the councils are saying our hands are tied, there's nothing we can do. Well, there is actually, you know, because their their job as councillors is actually to look out for public health and for the people that they're representing. Mm -hmm. And they're not doing their job properly as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've gone to Sefton Council just recently and questioned them. And also um, went to the latest council meeting in Sefton in in September and I raised a whole load of questions. and supplementary questions that I verbally delivered to them on the day, um, calling them um, to take health into consideration. And especially in light of the recent court cases in the UK that actually confirm electrosensitivity. Um, one is for a, a child who um, was unable to attend school because she was sensitive to Wi Fi and uh, eventually went through the courts. And the judge agreed that. Um, you know, under the um, the Equality Act, that she that her health does need to be taken into account, and and was un- awarded a special um, education plan. Um, so that was you know well, that's, that's set positive. Yeah, positive. That positive for that child. You mm. know, thank God that happened. But not positive for another young um, ch- child, a fifteen-year-old Jenny Fry. She was suffering with electrosensitivity. And her mother, Deborah Fry, was uh, this in 2015. And her mother was pleading with the school to accommodate her daughter because she was suffering so badly with electrosensitivity in the classroom full of Wi Fi. Mm. Um, That's an unfortunate surname, isn't it? Yeah. The school wouldn't listen. And she ended up hanging herself. She killed herself. So, uh, yeah. Because normally, if like a. like if there's been a case where it's been proven that yeah okay you're suffering from this therefore we'll do this normally that case sets the standard doesn't it 
Absolutely. And that case is more recent. That came after oh, okay. poor Jenny Fry had okay. um, killed herself, um, you know, and this one came after. Um, it's only a few years ago. Um, and there's been another case where a lady in her 50s has been awarded a full pension and early retirement because of electrosensitivity. That was a court case. And another case um, where the judges recently agreed that um, um, where the claimant has got a metal um, implant, um, medical implant, that, um, you know, is not covered by the guidelines and that the council does need to take this into account. So that was the verbal additional questions that I brought to the council and said, knowing all these court cases are in place, will they now take health into consideration? Well, they couldn't answer the questions. There was no one there who could answer the questions on the night. But here's all these 66 councillors that are passing applications for phone masks all the time couldn't answer them questions they had to wait and, until they got a response from health security agency um, uk which have just recently received and hot off the press today a letter's going out oh, so it'll cool. be going on our website um, in a few hours but this um, letter that i've received in response from health security agency uk um, via Sefton Council um, actually admits that um, the, there is interference with medical implants um, from this radiation, but they're putting the blame on or, or they're putting the onus on the uh, suppliers of the manufacturers of the implants need to comply <laughs> with the guidelines. How are they going to do that? You've got thousands of people with medical implants, metal implants. Um, how are All they pre-existing? Probably new technology as yeah. well. Ooh. I mean, these implants; these are people have actually given consent for them for their life-saving reasons. Some of them are actually, you know, for the delivery of chemo mm. within their body, or, or you know, for the to to for their for their. Um, protection with diabetes, you know, delivery of what they need for diabetes. Um, so if this radiation can affect those types of implants and give a, you know, a wrong signal and you get another big dose of chemo put through your body, you know, or um, it's affecting any metal in your in your body or yeah, it's absolutely. affecting your pacemaker in your body, you, you, that's that's life and death situations. And so they're putting the, they're putting the onus on. The, uh, sub, you know, the manufacturers. Mm. But what's really important about this is the fact that they're actually admitting that this radiation obviously enters into the body, which affects these me medical implants. Well, if it enters into the body, um, then they're admitting that it, this radiation enters into the body. We know that children take a deeper penetration of radiation into their bodies and adults so it's going to be entering in to affect the critical organs of the body as well so where's that so i'm i've done a freedom of information request to the health security agency saying where is your information where is your evidence to prove that this radiation doesn't affect all the critical organs of the body because mm. you're admitting that it enters the body and affects the medical implants well our heart o operates on electrical pulses you know, our bodies are, operate with electrical pulses. So they can't say what in one breath it affects your medical implants, but, oh, it doesn't affect any critical organs. You, your skin is a critical mm, of organ. Of course it is. It's the largest um, organ yeah. of the body. So um, there you go. Have, you know, have I'm, you I don't have done like a this. subject access request as well? A subject access. Yeah, a subject access request, which is a bit like an FOI, but it's purely for data. Um, I haven't I haven't used a subject okay. access request. I've just done a um, freedom of information request um, with a load of questions asking for data. And, uh, and now this letter back to Sefton Council and calling on the Health Security Agency and Sefton Council to stand by their reassurances of safety mm -hmm. and accept liability if anyone should suffer or die as a result of this. And again, I've brought to their attention the deaths of these two children at Milstead School and called for a full investigation. Absolutely. You know, so... Yeah, can, can you just remind can you just remind me and the audience of your website, please? It's radiation research 
www.freedomrequests.org. So you'll see the freedom of information requests questions are on there on the news section already. Um, but within the next hour or so, I'll be putting that letter up there to show um, everybody um, the, you know, what we're set, what we're calling for now. And I don't mm -hmm. know, how are they going to get out of this? We need all the lawyers over this now. The lawyers, they've opened themselves up. They've admitted that it affects medical implants, but it's up to the manufacturers to sort that out. Um, so if it's affecting the medical implants, what about our own own critical internal organs? Exactly. No, absolutely. So, you know, we have not given permission for them to actually, it's assault as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned. You know, we haven't given them any permission for this. Um, you know, so I think the I think the lawyers need to be getting involved with this now and start taking um, taking cases forward, more and more cases forward. No, Criminal absolutely. Damage. We need to. I just don't know how much I trust lawyers and things. Yeah, knowing they will swear oaths to bar guilds and all that kind of stuff. But the thing but is, there are the, good people out there. There are some, and we've already got some cases that have been won. Yeah. And when you think about it, these lawyers have got to remember. This radiation is going everywhere. No one's going to escape. It's going to affect them. It's going to affect their children. It's going to affect their mothers, their fathers, their brothers, their sisters, everyone. No, Are they willing not... to take that risk? We've got to stop it now before no, it's too late. Well, hopefully yeah. this podcast remains up on the air and hopefully it will draw more attention. Hopefully we'll get some more people going over to your website so they can look at more of the stuff that you do. And I wish you all the very best with your endeavours on this subject because I know yeah. how important it is to both yeah. you and society at large. Um, is there any last things that you'd like to get off your chest? Um, no, just a big, big, huge thank you to you, you know, for um, we need people like yourself, um, uh, alternative media, which it's great to see the public are turning to now in their droves Absolutely. because we can't trust the mainstream media anymore, unfortunately. You know, and mm. um, so I think it's 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 great that you're getting that, this out there to people. So I really appreciate what you do and thank you. Well, it's the very least that I can do. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for joining me. It's been fascinating listening to your experience and what you've got up to up to this point. And like I say, I wish you all the very best for the future. Everybody else who's been watching and listening, I hope you've enjoyed it. Please go and check out the website at radiationresearch.org. Brilliant stuff. But for now, look after yourselves, take care, and I will speak to you all again soon. Bye for now.